So welcome this afternoon to Community Tools to Prevent Gun Violence. This is the first workshop by the Washington State Gun Violence Coalition, Gun Violence Prevention Coalition. This coalition is pretty much brand new. It was a year ago that Catherine Persons of Everytown Survivor Network said, hey kids, let's build a coalition. <laughs> Last October she had the United We Stand uh, meeting. That's where the most of us just first met. And today is our first action out of that. Many of you were here this afternoon, at, or this morning, at the rally outside. I wish I could condense it into five minutes because it was the most heartening, the most moving thing I've been to. A, for one thing, we were honoring the victims of the Columbine shooting 20 years ago, and B, because there were so many public servants there just telling us what we have going on here in Washington State. We are rocking the country right now in gun violence prevention, and I just want you to be super proud about that. As a matter of fact, this quote by Margaret Mead, that part about changing the world, you cannot, you cannot look at our last three years here in Washington State and know, not know that we are changing the world at this point. So please give yourselves all a big hand. My name is Sean Turgeson, and I am a rank beginner at this stuff. It was three years ago when I was sitting on the curb of a street corner. I was supposed to be campaigning for some kind of initiative, and I was trying to learn the talking points by going, I, so they have to vote for I-1491, <laughs> and it's called the Extreme Risk Protection Act, and I do not have any idea of what either of those are, but I'm gonna go with it. That's why we have a coalition, because we have so many groups here in Washington State that are committed to gun violence prevention. Each one of us has our own strengths, our own talents, and we have now put together a coalition. And the cool thing about this coalition is that we're in coalition with the Seattle City's Attorney Office. Those are part of the group, they're one of the groups of people in Seattle and King County and Washington State that has taken the ERPO laws and they are running with them. ERPO is the topic of today's training and I just want to make it very clear to you that in two hours, in two hours amongst our peers, we will be the experts on ERPO. We will be the experts on ERPO, the greatest law that nobody knows anything about. <laughs> so your job after this, our mission is to get the word out. So welcome to this training. Pete Holmes, our Seattle, Surdy, our Seattle attorney, is a unique person in many ways. He's now in his third term as city attorney. He supervises an office of over 100 lawyers and 85 legal professionals. He's, so just we're learning about the city attorney office, he has sole supervisory control of all city litigations. As he mentioned earlier today, he successfully, his team successfully defended the Seattle firearms and ammunition tax uh, uh, tax from a legal challenge and he's currently working with outside um, uh, counsel to defend the city's safe storage firearm laws, safe storage firearm laws. His office prosecutes crimes including domestic violence and assault and Pete also champions, champions the use of value based Pete also champions the use value of community-based alternatives to incarceration like the LEAD program and especially for young people. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome Pete Holmes. Thank you, Sean. 
Thank, thanks all of you for being here today, this afternoon. Uh, I don't know how many were able to attend the rally on the uh, uh, outside this morning, but I thought that was a, a very moving experience, even though we're here on a somber anniversary of the Columbine shooting. Um, but you know, this is where we give energy to each other, not, to, not only to mention uh, tools, knowledge, and things to take forth from here today, uh, from Seattle City Hall, welcome, uh, but take everywhere and to help uh, promulgate what we're trying to do here in the city of Seattle. I want to call out, I see lots of different color shirts, uh, and I want to just make sure we very quickly go through some of the organizations that are here. The Alliance for Gun Responsibility, Renee Hopkins, where are you? Sorry. Not an organization, but I see uh, Adrian Diaz, Assistant Chief Adrian Diaz from the Seattle Police Department. Thank you, Adrian, for being here. The, um, Every Town Survivor Network is, has been represented here. Um, and of course, Every Town for Gun Safety is an amazing organization centered in New York. You'll probably hear some more about that today. Uh, Chris and I, Chris Anderson and I had uh, uh, the honor, the opportunity to go back to New York last year and explain some of the information that you're going to learn today to a national organization, well-funded, that's also trying to get the word out. Moms demand action for gun sex in America. See all those red shirts? You guys are my heroes. Thank you for all for being here. Uh, Washington ceasefire, of course. Yeah. I Robert, where are you? I got it now, right? <laughs> Grandmothers against gun violence. Hi, guys. The Seattle Brady campaign to prevent gun violence. I want, to, I want to call out another organization you may not be as aware of, but I was really proud, along with our King County Prosecutor, Dan Satterberg, to be a co-founder, along with uh, uh, Los Angeles City Attorney Mike Fuhr and Manhattan District Attorney Cy Vance, uh, an organization called Prosecutors Against Gun Violence. And I think that's a lot of what you're going to hear here today, is that prosecutors actually trying to step up and be a factor in reducing the the incredibly insane level of gun violence that we're experiencing in this country. So, <clears throat> so we, again, we all know that today is this 20th anniversary of, of Columbine, and uh, I think someone remarked this morning that, you know, when you used to be able to remember the names like Columbine and other cities now, with an average of one mass shooting a day in this country, it seems, it's, it's hard to remember. Um, we had, of course, our own shooting, I, I mentioned this morning, the Cafe Racer shooting and others. I mean, the, uh, Cheryl Strombo was here this morning speaking eloquently uh, about uh, the shooting at the Jewish Center. But the uh, Cafe Racer was the first shooting when I was in office. And uh, the, it was the same year that I had won the, uh, an award from Washington Ceasefire that really kind of I think drove home the responsibility that I have to make sure that this office is used in every way possible to extend gun violence uh, mitigation measures. But uh, what really drove it home for me was one thing was sitting in this building and hearing all those sirens racing up the street and then getting the calls from the mayor's office, from the police office, the police department, from other department directors uh, about what was going on. And then, not long after that, uh, meeting Kurt Geisel, the owner of Cafe Racer, and even more importantly, uh, Walt Stawicki, the father of the shooter, and hearing his extremely painful story about someone who knew that something was going to end badly, and it did, uh, despite his best efforts. So um, back then, seven years ago, no one knew what an extreme risk protection order is. Uh, Sean, I like to think that at least some people know what they are now, even if it is brand new here in Washington. But uh, there was no judge that was going to issue those protection orders, and then there was no one that would actually carry them out to implement them to make sure that guns were surrendered as required. So um, Walt didn't have those tools, and today we have them. 
I, it's not long after that, or about the same time, I, I, it's hard to remember because there's been such a progression of initiatives here in Washington State. But one of the early ones, sitting in a room along with Renee and others uh, in uh, Nick Hanauer's uh, offices, we were talking about uh, this relatively, as we reflect now, I think modest initiative to make sure that uh, <clears throat> background checks were required for anyone wanting to purchase a firearm. And I remember thinking, why aren't we going for an assault weapons ban? Right? I mean, these, this is nuts. Uh, I can't believe that our officers are out there sometimes outgunned by these, frankly, military-style weapons. And I say that as, as a gun owner, as, as a, a kid grew up in rural Virginia and owns guns, shot on the skeet and trap team, and you know, uh, am in no way talking about uh, denigrating the Second Amendment, but, but still trying to have some sanity. Why can someone have a fully loaded AR-15 in Seattle? and uh, we talk about whether we're an open carry state or not. By the way, I'm, the city attorney's been saying, that's not true, and I want people to stop saying that Washington is an open carry state, because it's not. Uh, everyone likes to say that, but visit the RCW sometime. Visit the attorney general's website and ask, see the question where it says, are we an open carry state or not? The statute that's relevant starts with the phrase, it shall be unlawful to carry a weapon in a manner that, and it lists all of the other uh, reasons that you can actually stop someone that's displaying a weapon in public. So that's one of the little just kind of side urban legends that I would love us all to see if we can't put to rest. Um, I do remember too, and we talked about it a little bit this morning, that there were some phrases you just couldn't use, like gun control. And I think that now we're starting to see that uh, uh, politicians like me, maybe we have your wind in our sails, that are you know stiffening our spines and able to really stand up and make sure that we go for common sense gun laws. But the, uh, the, uh, the fact that just this, I think it was yesterday, that uh, uh, the Alliance uh, published a report that we have now 10 laws that were passed in our legislature after, in this session. <clears throat> Frankly, it's because activists like you uh, spearheading initiatives to the voters really provided the leadership. When, when the politicians could not muster the courage to vote uh, in, in a sane way, successive initiatives have shown that there is a strong appetite for common sense gun laws in the state of Washington, and now our legislature is also picking it up and running with it. It is difficult to mount a campaign, just ask Renee. It's expensive, it's, it's time consuming, and wouldn't it be wonderful if our legislatures all across the country were actually enacting the laws that the people want to see implemented? <laughs> So I don't want to take a whole lot longer. I just want to frame this now. We've been talking about the laws, but consider for a moment, if you will, what if we have laws that are good laws, but they're not enforced? That's what we're here talking about today, that enforcement mechanism. And the interesting thing about it is that our office, in, in, in conjunction with the city council funding, the county council funding, uh, the county prosecutor's office, we got together and we saw before uh, extreme risk protection orders were even on the ballot, we saw that there was already one of those existing laws that was not being enforced. There is a law, it's been a law for some time in the state of Washington, and if you're in a domestic violence situation, you can petition the court for a firearm surrender order against your abuser. That has existed for some time, and people actually, in reliance on the law, uh, women particularly have gone out and gotten those orders only to find they're not self-executing. Uh, they, if, to the extent they even held a hearing, someone would, would say, oh, I gave those guns away or whatever, and that was usually sufficient. So the law was not uh, really being enforced. And that's when prosecutors, again, here locally got together and said, we've got to do something about this. And that's what the, the group you're going to hear from today, uh, the professionals here, are going to tell you a lot about, because when this was then put into place, ERPO came along and it was ready to go. It was really ready, the mechanism was there. And so it's one of those examples of the planets aligning at a point in time where we have both the law and the mechanism, and we know how to do this. So that's the message you wanna, you wanna take out today rather than simply thoughts and prayers. Here are some nuts and bolts that you can use instead. 
uh, to actually give content to common sense gun laws. So um, I do want to uh, just point out a couple of other quick things. The other piece, the other component, of course, of all of this is money. And you know, it costs money to stand up a dedicated unit like you're gonna hear from today. And thank goodness the city council and the county council all came forward with, with the, the money that we needed to show that this could work. First starting small and then broadening it to a regional uh, gun task force. It's been pretty amazing. I do look back uh, fondly now on the long, long, almost interminable meetings that were held in my office with many representatives from law enforcement agencies all over the region, from the county prosecutor's office and others, all talking about, um, as you might imagine, the incredibly complex uh, mechanisms that are required to have an order issued in one court implemented in another city outside the city of Seattle, but maybe within King County. You can imagine too, just imagine this, and I look over at uh, Chief Diaz here to say, basically we're gonna take that order and give it to a law enforcement officer and say, please go get this gun from someone who doesn't want to give it to you and who has demonstrated proclivity for violence. Um, this is, thank goodness, we have, we have our law enforcement officers. But I, also to give credit to our own wonky lawyer prosecutors is that we're the guys that are trying to make sure that we connect the dots and make sure that it can happen with the strength, the rule of law that we're actually implementing and making the promise of protection, uh, not just for domestic violence situations, but for families that have long standing concerns about mental health of a family matter, give them some hope that there's, there's relief. So anyway, without further ado, I am really again honored to be here to speak to you. Please carry the energy you have from this, this meeting forward and the tools that you're learning and, and let's go and let's make this, make this world a little bit safer. Thank you, so much. Thank you all. I'm just feeling the glow of that for a moment. Many years ago, Dr. Martin Luther King asked the question, what are you doing for others? Three years ago, King County Council members created the King County Martin Luther King Medal. They award this medal to activists who best answer Dr. King's question, what are you doing for others? In 2018, they chose Betty William Watson, the Executive Director of Multi-Communities, for her 30 year, 33 years of anti-violence work. Betty calls us and she works mostly in the African-American faith communities. She's working in our community. For many in our community, she's been a lifeline for those fleeing from domestic and sexual violence. When she received the medal, there were a bunch of reporters around, photographs were being taken, and she said, look at that. I'm a 33-year overnight sensation. <laughs> She's been in the trenches. Additionally, she was awarded the Jenny McCarthy Award for Excellence in Advocacy from the King County Coalition Ending Gender-Based Violence and was a nominee for Inspiring, uh, so young folks in the room get this, she was a nominee for Inspiring Positive Aging Through Advocacy by the Sound Generations. But he also works with batterers. She's working on the other side of the equation and she's created domestic violence prevention programs for at-risk at males age nine to 99. Ask her about her current project called Closing the Circle, Ending Silence and Shame. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Betty Williams Watson. years ago, I was an abused wife. I was married to a black minister who was seven feet, two inches tall, and he could quote the Bible from front to back and pray and sing, and he 
thought he had angel wings, so to speak. But when he came home, there was hell to pay. I left him uh, because of my children, I think, more than what was happening in that relationship because he picked up my, I was breastfeeding my five week old baby and he jerked my five week old baby away from my breast and threw her across the room on the couch and hit my daughter in the head with the telephone and I could hear the, my then four year old could hear it cracking against her skull. And it dawned on me that there was nothing I could do if I wanted us to survive, but to leave him. And so I, I was able to do that in a safe manner. My church turned their back on me and told me it was something I was doing that was wrong and to go, go back home and be a good wife. Uh, but there were three strong African-American elder women who helped me through the whole process, before, doing, and after. And so it's been a journey. My journey has included saying, making a vow to God and myself that if, Lord, if, if you help me make it through, I want to be able to help someone else not have to go through this. And so that's been my shopping cart that I've packed around for the last uh, 33 plus years, along with two strong African American men uh, who are loving and healthy, who have been in long marriage relationships, but they, we all have a passion for ending gender-based violence. And they have just really been there with me throughout. And I'm thankful and grateful for them. You know, you can't talk about domestic violence or sexual violence Without, without also linking it with gun violence. Too many of our women, black and African American girls and women, are at the second highest level of increased danger and being victim survivors of violence. And so I have a lot of work to do in my community and I call it oftentimes I am on a skateboard backpedaling in quicksand, trying to get these issues into the church and for people to recognize that, you know, there's no protection up in the black church or anywhere else. There's no completely safe place. So honor protection orders. Let's talk about domestic and sexual violence and gun violence. Let's open that door because it's in the house. Believe me, it is in the house. And we have to address it because if we don't, lives will be lost. People are at risk. And this morning, it was just playing in my head about the Langston Hughes poem, uh, Mother to Son. I want to do it for you because it describes the journey. Well, son, I'll tell you, life for me ain't been no crystal stare. It's had tacks in it and splinters and boards torn up and places with no carpet on the floor, bare. But all the time I've been a climbing on and reaching landings and turning corners and sometimes going in the dark where there ain't been no light. So boy, don't you turn back. Don't you sit down on them steps. Cause you'd find it's kinda hard. Don't you fall now. For eyes are still going, honey. Eyes are still climbing. And life for me Ain't been no crystal stare. In black faith communities, we need to break shame and silence about domestic and sexual violence. 
And we know that it's strongly linked to the other forms of, of violence, gun violence, poverty, homelessness, mental health, chemical dependency, and other issues. And we need to work actively to make sure that we keep those church doors open to not only addressing these issues, but that the protection order, when a woman has a protection order or ERPO order that is respected and treated with validity and that is recognized and owned up to from the pulpit to the door, you know, to keep victim survivors safe within the confounds of the church. That's the last turf, I think, we need to really crack and open the door because things are still, in 2019, they are still, it's not even a topic of discussion and that's what our organization does. And you have to understand that we do this without a salary. We have never have a, had a salary for the past 33 years. We just love and are passionate about ending violence. And we know the money's going to come, and if you can help us out, please do. Uh, but the, it's been about our love of community. It's been about helping our people. And it's been about me sending a message to the different communities that I work in, from the pulpit to the door, so to speak, and, uh, that I'm here. You know, and I believe that if there is not a door of opportunity, that you should just design one That's right. <laughs> and make that opening. What I mean by that is there are teachable moments when you can educate people. And that is, you know, that is something that's really helpful to educate a person about peacemaking and to be there for them. Don't close the door on them. Uh, it's not considered to be an abnormal amount of times. I think the average amount of times that women return to abusive relationships, and by the way, I returned seven times. But each time I was packing my bag mentally, emotionally, and psychologically, and understand, beginning to get more educated and understanding that you know, you don't have a choice here. You know, you and your children could be killed, and he might also kill, him, kill himself. He threatened to many times. I just want you to know, Martin Luther King has such a great, he le led such a, a, a great life, and, but it was challenging, and some of the quotes are just some of the scripts from his life, I believe. One of them is, I have tried to offer them my deepest compassion while maintaining my conviction that social change most meaningfully uh, comes through nonviolent action. He also said, nonviolence is a powerful and just weapon which cuts without wounding and ennobles the man who wills it. It is a sword that heals. I have been privileged to serve victim survivors and those at risk, and I consider it an honor and a privilege. And I think that's the, the way to walk with that, is that it's an honor for us to be able to address these issues. It's an honor to have ERPO in place. It's an honor to do what you can while you are occupying this planet to help and serve others. And on that note, I had a lot, I have a lot to say. I'm a two hour speaker, but on that <laughs> note, <laughs> I shall end and we thank you. <laughs> thank you all very, very much. When earlier I mentioned that uh, King County, Seattle, uh, 
and Seattle have taken herbal laws and run with them. These are the two of the people who are at the head of the pack. Our first, uh, well, whoop, which way? Yes, Chris Anderson. Chris Anderson is the director of the Domestic Violence Unit at the Seattle City Attorney's Office. Nope, Kim Wyatt. No, Kim no, 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 no. Co-presenting. Yep. Kimberly Wyatt is a senior deputy prosecuting attorney from the King County. Both of these two are in the forefront of creating the Regional Domestic Firearms Enforcement Unit. I had the pleasure of meeting Chris at one of the coalition meetings uh, earlier. And at the end of the meeting, you know, we were talking and I kind of went all enthusiastic on, on him and said, you know, this work you're doing is really great. And Chris got this look of introspection and uh, he said, yeah, I think it's the best work I've ever done for the city. A month ago, Kimberly. <laughs> <laughs> A month ago, uh, Kimberly testified for the red flag hearings for the United States Senate Committee on the Judiciary. Yeah. <laughs> I watched a bit of that, and she was cool, calm, calm, collected. She was not impressed by those senators. She was just so on point delivering the message, and woo, yeah, absolutely. In her written testimony, she said this. As a prosecutor, rarely if ever, a prosecutor rarely if ever has an opportunity to intervene prior to gun violence happening. Instead, we react after the gun violence has happened. Then she said, this has been the most important and rewarding work of my 18 year career as a prosecutor. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome Chris Anderson and Kimberly Wyatt. We are. Yeah. Well, good afternoon. That always gets me when we um, give the quote about the most important work, but I do truly believe that. And Chris and I have often talked after meetings and said, this is some of the most important work that we are doing. It is a movement. And we, so we thank you all for walking alongside of us in that move. Yeah. And we're, and we're really excited to be able to present to you and be invited to present to this uh, group of people because um, you know, these organizations, the Alliance for Gun Responsibility, and all the organizations that, that Pete listed off are responsible for allowing us to do the work that we do today. Is that better? Because we wouldn't be doing this work if it wasn't for the community support. That's where it came from. That's where the voice came from. Um, and what I want, and what's really exciting about this too is that I'm supposed to talk about the history of ERPA, but I think really what I want to talk about is how the history is being made right now. Uh, we are. You know, when I, I have a few clips that I'm going to show you about some of the stuff that's happening at the state and federal level, and also, as you know, the local level, this is what's happening at the local level. We're getting the word out. We're talking about domestic violence. We're talking about um, ERPOs and extremist protection orders and gun violence. And a huge debt of gratitude goes to everyone in this room that made this possible. Um, I know Renee told me a quote one time. I don't know if it was a quote. Maybe it's her quote, where she says, God, this is so difficult, this, the change and the things we were doing and the, trying to get money to, for the work that we had to do. And we had everything backing us. We had the data, we had the statistics, everything was, in fact, even as a prosecutor, as Kim was saying, she'd been a prosecutor for 18 years, I've been about 15 years, is, you know, as much as you have all this information, it's still like, we didn't know how bad it was until we really started digging into this work, until we started reading those protection orders every day and realizing that these, these surrenderers weren't, weren't, weren't getting served. So we want to thank you, the debt of gratitude to you. To, we feel res, that you're responsible in a huge way of the work that we're doing and allows us to do that work and we're really thankful for that. Um, there, like Pete said, there's not let, there's 10 bills that were passed this year on gun violence. It's amazing. It's amazing. And I think it's safe to say that we will pass policies this year that make Washington State one of, if not, the, mo the state with the most aggressive, the most, the strongest laws that address intersection of gun violence and domestic violence, and we will continue to make that progress. Um, also, towards issues with uh, 
a suicide, including SB 5181, that is headed toward the governor's desk for signature. Um, I want to talk. Yeah. And I think, you know, the momentum that we have right now, and I've had these conversations with Pete, I've had these conversations with uh, Renee, is like, and, and I think maybe I'm a little naive because I haven't been doing this as long as they have. I certainly haven't been involved in this struggle as long as Renee, but I feel like there's this huge palpable momentum happening right now. And when I have to look back and do this presentation and think about what I want to talk about and, what I, and the clips I want to show today, I only had to go back to March to think about what I needed to do. I didn't have to reach back to find statistics from last year or the years before, but I could look at what was happening in the last few months. I have a clip from March 26th, which is Kim, and, I've been, uh, and I also have one at the state level from Senator Dingra, and I wanted to play that clip for you first, um, and, and then I'll, I'll let Kim talk more about the ERPOs. I will agree with my colleague that domestic violence cases are messy, they're fluctuating, and they're very dangerous. But we also have to take a look at the history of domestic violence in this state and take a look at discretion. There's a reason why in this state there's a mandatory arrest law for domestic violence. Because at that time, there was a need for that discretion not to be there because women were dying. Because you would have law enforcement respond to domestic violence scene and tell the guy to go take a walk. It was considered something that happened in a marriage and these crimes were not taken seriously. So that discretion was removed and we had mandatory arrest. We're at a point in here where this is not an academic discussion. Women are dying every day through the hands of their loved one. Not an academic discussion at all. They're dead. So yes, we are removing discretion here because once again, it is needed because the data from decades of work supports it. I apologize for being late. Uh, the hearing will come to order. Uh, this hearing today is to examine red flag laws for uh, lack of a better term, we're trying to identify people in our communities that are exhibiting uh, pretty extreme behavior in terms of mental health issues where they become a danger to themselves and others and allow law enforcement and sometimes family members to go to a court to say this person needs some help and we need to stop violence before it occurs. There'll be a robust due process component. We'll have a witness to talk about the kind of due process you need to make such a determination. There are 15 states that have a form of this. And one of the reasons we're having this hearing is because of Senator Blumenthal. Nobody has been more passionate about trying to find a solution. Uh, it's not the solution that he would prefer sometimes. It's just doing something rather than doing nothing. And Senator Durbin's been that way about immigration for years. So I really do believe that Senator Blumenthal, that after today, we can sort of define the problem, that there are a lot of people may be worried, is the government going to come take your guns? And the answer is no. Nobody's going to come and take a gun from you. But there will be a process for law enforcement and family members uh, to petition a court to say that somebody in your neighborhood or somebody down the street across town is about to blow. So I'm a big fan of the Second Amendment. I own uh, firearms, and I try to be responsible in my ownership. But at the same time, every right has limits. Thank you. Ms. White. Good morning, Chairman Graham, Ranking Member Feinstein, and distinguished members, members of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and for your leadership on this critical life-saving tool, extreme risk protection orders. My name is Kim Wyatt. I am a senior deputy prosecuting attorney from King County, Washington. For the past year, I have served as a firearms prosecutor in the Regional Domestic Violence Firearms Enforcement Unit, specifically as the extreme risk protection order prosecutor. 
My responsibilities are to advise and assist law enforcement and family members on all aspects of extreme risk protection orders, from the petitions to the court proceedings. And I can tell you this has been some of the most important and rewarding work of my career. You see, as a prosecutor, rarely, if ever, do we get the opportunity to intervene prior to the gun violence occurring. Instead, we re react. We receive that incident report after the crime has occurred. My colleagues and I know we have few brief windows of opportunity to intervene to prevent future harm. This life-saving legislation creates one of those opportunities and allows much needed intervention to prevent suicide, homicide, and other acts of community violence, while at the same time protecting people's constitutional rights with due process built in. Although all of these cases described above are factually different, there is a common thread. All involve someone experiencing a behavior health crisis or exhibiting violent behavior and having access to firearms. What we have learned over the past year is that the time to act to prevent future tragedies is upon us. What we see in Washington State is that this law is working to save lives. Every state in this nation deserves to have this tool, the ability to react quickly to threats of suicide and homicide and prevent irreversible violence. This is what the public expects and most importantly, deserves. Thank you. And you have a, you have a specific team just designated for that, is that correct? We do, we work on orders to, we work on firearm enforcement with folks that are subject to other protective orders, for, so domestic violence, stalking, and sexual assault, and as well as extreme risk protection orders, yes. That's pretty, that's somewhat unique around the country. It is. I applaud you for it. Thank you. So thank you, that was a, truly a privilege to be there and to be in that room. I'm glad that experience is over, I can tell you that. <laughs> but um, so you are all much friendlier crowd. Um, but we're gonna transition just a little bit to talk to you about some of the extreme risk protection order work we've done in King County this past year in 2018. And I know the slide said to talk about the process. Oh, there we go. To talk about the process, but we really felt the best way to, to talk about the work is to tell some of the stories. And so I'm gonna show a little bit about the stats and then just give you some of the case scenarios, including one that we had this week, just to give you context on what we're seeing on a weekly basis in our unit. So in 2018, in King County alone, there were 71 extreme risk protection orders. 61% or 86% were granted at the full hearing. So all of the orders that were presented to the court on the emergency basis or the temporary extreme risk protection order, all of those have been granted. And then the second part of that process is a full hearing where the respondent or the restricted party has an opportunity to come to court and to argue against that order. So we've had quite a bit of success in King County at that full hearing. And that's something that our unit, we, the prosecutors, accompany law enforcement to those hearings to make sure that legally the court is one, informed about what's going on, and two, we assist in any legal argument that's needed. And we have had 10% or 14% denied, and denied for various reasons from information being a little too old, and the court felt like there wasn't an immediate crisis, to other witnesses coming in and the court was making a credibility call. But the vast majority of the extreme risk protection orders in our unit have been granted. 69% or 69 out of those 71 extreme risk protection orders were done by law enforcement. And I know Chief Diaz, I don't know if he's still in the room, his folks have done the vast majority, the Seattle Police Department Crisis Unit, and you're gonna hear from Sergeant Eric Piskonski later today, and he, his unit really does get tremendous credit for their work. So, but I think this number really surprised me. There's 69 law enforcement ERPOs been done, but only two family members, two, in King County have come forward, and that's where we need you, right? Because obviously, we're working on training law enforcement, and you see there's 14 different agencies, but I think in King County we have 39 different law enforcement agencies. So we have a lot more work to do on the outreach part of it. 
And so that's where we need your help because like anything, there was no funding, right? The law passed, there's no money for implementation. So efforts like this and to be able to spread that word is really critical. And we did, in cooperation with law enforcement, law enforcement had seized 211 guns recovered out of those 69 ERPOs. And we broke down a little bit of you know, we were interested in the beginning when we did the work, there was a lot of cases of threats of suicide. And then as the work has progressed, and then certainly after Parkland, and then certainly, I would say in the last couple of months as well, we've had more cases coming in where there's threats of harm to others, threats of mass shooting. And you can see that there's a combination on the bottom, 22% contain both of those. And I could tell you those hearings, being in that courtroom, they, they do feel different. You know, when you have somebody who's in a behavioral health crisis is there, I can, and Sergeant Poskonski's team gets all the credit to this, but I've been in court where the, he's had respondents turning to his officers and thanking them for intervening and saving his life. And that's why I say that's, it gives me chills when I think about it because those are really life-changing moments to see. On the other spectrum are folks that you're pretty concerned, you're pretty shocked that they have a firearm in the first place and that nobody, they haven't had any intervention in that system. And I'm gonna talk about one of those cases in just a second. So I wanted to talk a little bit about a couple different scenarios to give you an idea of cases that we have worked on. This one I believe was a Renton Police Department case where it was a respondent, I think had no criminal history in the system, had had a recent head injury in the last year or so, but the most important thing was there was a noticeable change in behavior of this father. And he became paranoid and delusional, and something that was really different, the family or the adult children told law enforcement, was that their dad was very frugal, and all of a sudden he was handing out money to strangers on the street, he was gambling, just a very change in his normal pattern and behavior. And there were some threats to the adult children. And the most significant thing and concerning to the family was that in a two week time span, he purchased 26 firearms and a large, large amount of money or of ammunition. I believe, if I'm remembering, it was $22,000 of firearms in one transaction, and then I think another 11 or 13 in a second. So had not law enforcement in that case, working with that family member, or, or that family, these were adult children, had they not intervened, it's hard to say, but the sign, it wasn't looking good for what this guy was doing, right? He all of a sudden acquired all those firearms and was very paranoid and delusional. So law enforcement was able to step in with the help of that family and get the herbo. Somebody tell me if we're running short on time, I'm not sure. Okay, we're, we're okay, okay. And so this is a case from Seattle Police Department. This was Sergeant Poskonski's team. There was an elderly gentleman who had some definite uh, behavioral changes, including suicide by cop statements and also um, possible dementia. So that's an area of extremist protection order that might be somewhere we have to look at in the future. But the difficulty in this case was he was being medically ev evaluated. He was served with a temporary ERPO he refused to comply with that ERPO. And so we worked with Sergeant Poskonski and his team and they were able to execute a search warrant and get those 26 firearms that he had safely into police custody. I share this story as an example of a case. This was a student that had just turned 18 at one of our local high schools here and he brought a gun to school. And you know, he didn't make any threats to anybody with that gun, but he had it in, I think it was in the pencil pouch of his backpack, and with the safety off, and it was loaded. And this was a case that I think an SPD homicide detective actually contacted our office because, oddly, when the charge gets referred, bringing a gun to school is a gross misdemeanor in our state. That charge um, does not carry a loss of a firearm which is sort of interesting, you know, that's a problem. So that's a problem. It's, it is a problem, amongst some others, like unlawfully displaying a weapon, so if you unlawfully display, display a firearm, that al also does not carry the loss of firearm. So we were concerned, and the, the detective was concerned just about the student's judgment, and so we petitioned, or SPD petitioned for an extremist protection order, and the court granted it. It wasn't even, 
we weren't sure how the court was going to come down because there was no threats here, right? But just the mere act of being negligent with the firearm and then being on the school grounds, the court did issue that. And I want to say that that's temporary, right? So this is a one-year temporary order. It's not a lifetime ban on firearms, but hopefully that student's been able to get some intervention. And this is the, I think the last case that I want to talk to you about, which was a case that came in just, came in last week, but we had our full hearing this past Tuesday in Superior Court. And this is also one of the SPD crisis team cases. And this one really, I was emailing Chris late one night and my, and my boss, David Martin, I was very concerned about this particular case and this individual. This, it was involved the respondent or a gentleman that came into one of our local hospitals, his girlfriend brought him in. And she said that he was having fantasies or delusions of wanting to do a mass shooting. So she brought him to the ER. He met with social workers. The hospital does a duty to warn. They have to call the police, the police respond. And what was kind of surprising is that he was not detained by the designated mental health professionals in this case. But what they did instead is they brought in the crisis intervention team from SPD and they were able to intervene and do an extreme risk protection order in that case. And this, we share this example because we know after Pittsburgh and after other mass shootings that we have to start focusing on ideology as well. We have to look at those extremist views. And so this is somebody that we believe had some sovereign citizen leanings and some other really concerning views against minorities, including, um, I, I think you can see the quote up there, that he wanted to shoot Muslims to further the white race. So that was a case that was just handled this week. And we do feel very thankful for SPD's involvement and inter interaction there to intervene. And I don't know where we are in time, but I'm happy to answer any questions you all have about the process. I know you're going to hear from our great panel as well. The address of your emergency. My dad's beating my mom. Is that your mother screaming in the background? Yeah. They just tried to choke me. This no, is not the first time. Get away from me. No, no. Any weapons in the home? They're in the great room. Are you coming soon? Yes, honey, they're coming, okay? Do you want me to talk to him? I want to help you. It's not okay. No, it's not helping me. Nothing's helping. Hello? Hello? I just shot my wife. You just shot your wife? Yes. Is she still breathing? No.
In response to those sobering statistics, the Washington State Legislature passed House Bill 1840 in 2014, which required respondents subject to a domestic violence protection order to surrender their firearms. In 2016, the Extreme Risk Protection Order referendum was passed statewide by an overwhelming majority. Extreme Risk Protection Orders allowed family members or law enforcement to petition the court for removal of firearms from individuals that pose an immediate risk to themselves or others. Both the bill and referendum passed without ending any funding for implementation, and all the courts routinely issued these orders to surrender firearms, there was no mechanism of enforcement and most of the orders were ignored. In 2016, the city of Seattle and King County convened a multidisciplinary, multi-jurisdictional workgroup headed by retired Judge Ann Levinson to address the lack of effective enforcement of firearms surrender laws. After a proposed plan, several test cases, and a successful pilot project in 2017, the city and county jointly funded the Regional Domestic Violence Firearms Enforcement Unit in January of 2018. The following is a brief summary of the Regional Domestic Violence Firearms Enforcement Unit's harm reduction model. There are three fundamental phases of enforcement. Number one, referral and review of surrender orders. Number two, risk and assessment and staffing of referred cases. And three, execution and removal of firearms. Number one, referral and review. There are three primary types of cases received by the firearms unit for screening. Emergency protection orders, criminal cases where a firearm is identified, and extreme risk protection orders. The first type of case are protection orders which are reviewed daily by the firearms coordinators before being forwarded to law enforcement for service. Second are criminal cases where an order to surrender is issued with a no contact order and firearms are identified in the police report by the filing prosecutor or victim advocate. And third are petitions for extreme risk protection orders requested by law enforcement. The firearms coordinators review the documents related to the case to determine if there is a firearm concern. Once the firearms coordinator has determined that the case is firearms positive, the victim is contacted immediately. The firearms coordinators function as both advocates and trauma-informed investigators. They investigate the abuser's access to firearms by asking targeted questions such as when firearms were last seen, the location of any firearms, and a description of the firearms. They also integrate safety planning specific to domestic violence and firearms and offer domestic violence education and referrals to community resources. After the firearms interview, the firearms coordinators gather additional information on risk and firearms from other sources, such as the offender's firearm purchase history, criminal history, pawn history, or hunting license information. They interview witnesses, prior victims, review previous protection orders and police reports, and review social media. Number two, case staffing. The firearms coordinators select the highest risk cases for case staffing with the unit prosecutors, advocates, and law enforcement to determine the best course of intervention. Intervention can take many forms, from executing a search warrant, filing criminal charges for noncompliance, increasing bail on a pending case, or setting a review hearing. It also includes creative interventions, such as calling a defense attorney to arrange for and encourage voluntary compliance, asking for a declaration to account for firearms that were sold or transferred, and even appearing on the record at a civil hearing to provide information to the court. Number three, execution and removal. The unit has a dedicated team of detectives that serve protection orders and execute search warrants. If the abuser is not already a prohibited possessor, the serving officer will request that the respondent voluntarily surrender all the firearms to the serving officer at the time of service. Equipped with the information gathered by the firearms coordinators, the officer can say, for example, you need to surrender the gun that you keep in the ottoman next to the fireplace. I can take it for you right now. 
which has a bigger impact than the court says you have to turn in your guns. This has been the unit's most successful way to disarm abusers. If the firearms are out of county or out of state, the unit forwards the investigation and relevant information to the law enforcement agency in that jurisdiction to assist in removal. Prior to this position, I was a trial attorney, did um, domestic violence cases. And so I dealt with the aftermath. The incident had already happened now, and the team has the opportunity to act before um, that something happens. I've had the pleasure, it's the best part of this job, is to call and say, uh, the guns are secured. We know where they are. Our moderator for the panel discussions that we're about to have, Therese Todd, is a domestic and gun violence survivor. Since 2004, she's been working to support other survivors and public awareness. In 2007, she co-founded the Thrivers Action Group, group made up of safe domestic survivors. TAG's mission statement was to plant the seed of social awareness one truth at a time. TAG survivors have shared their stories all over Washington State. In 2009, TAG received the King County Coalition Against Domestic Violence Take Action Award. Here's a sentence for you. Therese Todd, take action. That is a complete <laughs> sentence. You don't need to add anything more to know about this lady. She's gathered hundreds and hundreds of petition signatures for ERPO. She served on the Washington Supreme Court's Domestic Violence Ab Ab Advisory Group. She's testified before every legislator that's ever been born. <laughs> and she's a member of the Everytown Survivors Fellowship Network. Once you see her up here, you will be fully informed that this woman, Therese, will never stop planting the seeds of social awareness. Please help me welcome Therese Todd. Thank you so much, and uh, I am just so very, very, very honored and privileged to be here today, and I think we owe a great debt to the city of Seattle for hosting us, the city attorney's office, and Pete, thank you so much. Um, the King County, who's also put so much into the Regional Firearm Surrender Unit and done so much. I, I started working with King County Prosecutor's Office long, long ago, and they have just been fantastic in both domestic violence and gun violence prevention. And then um, I just, I'm just thrilled to be here, and I really want to thank personally Catherine Person, who has done so much to help us pull this all together. You're the, you are amazing, absolutely amazing. So uh, if I could invite our distinguished panel members to come forward, I think we've got Amy Roberts. So you guys give her a big hand. Uh, and Karen is coming up to join her. And then I think Kim. So, um, I'm going to start with uh, Amy because uh, Amy and I kind of have some history. Uh, the uh, uh, Washington State Supreme Court has a, called the Gender and Justice Commission and uh, they put together some work groups to help with uh, addressing the issue of domestic violence offender intervention treatment. And uh, how many folks here have domestic violence at least training or background or history or you've been involved somehow, right, a little bit? Oh, we've got a lot of work to do to teach you folks what's going on. How many people um, have done any direct service with any victims of sexual assault or, or gun violence or actually worked with folks? Okay, good, so I, I kind of need to know my audience and I, that's good to know. Well, Amy has done work with domestic violence victims with domestic violence offenders, and as she is now the state's 
sole uh, full-time employee at DSHS who actually certifies domestic violence offender treatment programs. These are certified programs where risk assessment is done and folks who are abusive are uh, sometimes are sent in by the courts and sometimes voluntarily uh, so that there can be actual treatment and intervention to help you know, interrupt that cycle of violence. And we're very lucky to have Amy because she has traveled all across this state to um, look at domestic violence prevention programs to make sure that they were meeting the standards that the law now provides because of her good hard work. We've had a lot of good reforms and uh, we are just really lucky to have her and, and she'll be able to help connect a lot about the difference, the connection between domestic violence and extreme risk protection orders. And we're also very lucky to have Karen Brownson who is the community safety manager um, in the violence and injury prevention unit at Public Health for Seattle and King County. She works on fire harm tragedy prevention and child safety. Previously, Karen led the creation of Washington State Suicide Prevention Plan at the Washington State Department of Health. Karen's background is in social work. In her work and in her life, Karen has firsthand, uh, she knows firsthand the toll that trauma, violence, and firearm tragedy take on young people and their families and communities as well as the community's resilience in the face of adversity and loss. She's dedicated to partnering with those most affected by firearm tragedy to build a safer and more just King County public health firearm violence prevention page where you can learn about their work in promoting firearms safe storage is at www.lockitup.org. So you might want to write that up down, lockitup.org, and you can go and learn a lot. So Karen is here to help us. And then we are very, very lucky that Kim is able to join the panel today. And you guys already know so much about her. And aren't we fortunate that we've got a national leader on this issue right here in our very own hometown. So. so um, I, Kim, you know, if you want to give another two or three minutes and then pass it on to Karen and then pass it on to Amy, I'd like each of you just to give us a little bit of an introduction of yourself and what you do or whatever you want to say, and then we'll go into some questions. Okay. So you all uh, know that I'm a prosecutor with the Regional Domestic Violence Firearms Enforcement Unit. Specifically, I'm a senior prosecutor with King County. And for, since the unit formed in 2018, I've worked closely with Chris and my other colleagues both on orders to surrender weapons, so we're trying to get firearms from those that are subject to the various protection orders, mainly our domestic violence cases and our high-risk domestic violence cases. And then I've also done the vast majority of my time is spent doing extreme risk protection orders. Thank you so uh -huh. much. Is this on? Oh, good. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Karen Brownson. You just heard all about me. Um, and the work I do at Public Health focuses largely on uh, promoting safe storage of firearms, which certainly comes into play with ERPOs, as we've seen in the current policy season. Um, I'm also on our firearm injury data team, which has just put out some new data products. And I, I have a few slides about one that really sums up uh, the toll of suicide in King County over the last several years. And the work working on the state suicide prevention plan was really what kind of brought me into gun violence prevention. Um, that was a gateway drug, and I'm happy to be doing this work with lots of knowledge about suicide and homicide. Thanks. And I'm Amy Roberts. I don't know how much more I can add. Thanks, Therese, oh, for that bio. Oh, you're, you're the best. <laughs> um, I, I did start my career working with victims of domestic violence and sexual assault. I helped fill out more protection orders than I can count. Um, I'm really excited about the extreme risk protection order and the opportunity that gives us um, to do what we couldn't do before. And on a personal note, I can't help but think um, in my own family that my own uncle's death could have been prevented with something like this. Um, I was at the house the night he melted down and killed himself. And our family would have done anything to have something like this to be able to pre prevent that. So um, I'm really excited to be here. That's it. There you go. Oh, boy. Aren't they? You guys are great. So Karen, do you want to start with your slides? Should we, sure. should we go ahead and get started with that? Can you get those going? Is there a, OK. Do you need a clicker? I do need a clicker if there is one. Is this the clicker? I think this is the clicker. Let's hope so. 
Okay, thanks. So I'll try to go through this quickly and painlessly. If anyone loves data, we have a, a much larger document. Think of this not as a PowerPoint presentation, but as a report shaped like a PowerPoint is the best way to sum it up. So it's very wordy. If anyone's an instructional designer, don't yell at me. Um, so I, I know. <laughs> Remember, it's a report shaped like a PowerPoint. So. I've been working with a team of program people and epidemiologists at Public Health on updating our firearm injury data products. The first one that we did focused on fatal injuries from firearms, and these were some of our key findings. I will sum them up really briefly. If anybody wants a copy of this, it'll be on our website next week. Um, so we looked at the time period from 2002 to 2016 and found that 747 people who lived in King County died from injuries from firearms over those four years. And the vast majority of those deaths were by suicide. Um, suicide probably gets the least press of firearm-related deaths, possibly second to community violence that isn't mass shootings. Um, but suicide takes a big toll in King County, and the majority of people who die by firearms um, do die by suicide. So there were almost as, almost three times as many suicides as homicides in King County over that time period. And the age group most affected by this is people over 65, largely men. Um, we also saw, and this was interesting, so there were lots of disparities in our data about homicide, but suicide really wasn't geographically focused. It wasn't focused in a particular income group. It was really more spread out and affected all populations. And I think this is something to keep in mind when we're thinking about suicide, that it's not easy to make assumptions about who is the most at risk. Um, and particularly in King County, this touches every community. So I'll, I'll show you some images of these things. Um, so suicide rates by firearm increase with age. And there are lots of reasons for this. Um, people under 18 have much less access to guns than people who are adults, for example. But we can see those rates going way up by age with older adults more likely to use firearms. We also know that suicide disproportionately affects men. And I could spend a really long time talking to you about gender norms. I'm not going to do that right now. But men and boys are much more likely than women and girls to die by suicide across the age range. We also see some racial disparities. Um, AIAN means American Indian and Alaska Native communities. And that group of people and people who were part of white communities were way more likely to die by suicide than people in other racial and ethnic groups in King County. There's a lot more information about that here. And we looked at whether there are disparities by neighborhood poverty. With interpersonal violence, there definitely are. With suicide, there aren't. And I think a lot of assumptions are made that, that suicide only affects affluent communities. Definitely not the case. Um, and suicide rates didn't differ significantly by firearm among different kinds of communities. I think this is something really important to think about when we're thinking about how ERPOs can be used as a suicide prevention tool. We also saw higher firearm suicide rates in the south region of King County. Um, keep in mind this is a giant geographic region that contains urban and rural and everything in between communities. When we look at gun ownership, there's also just many more um, households that own firearms in the south region of King County, and there's probably a correlation there. So those are just some really basic data about firearm suicide in King County. And you know, on a personal level, I've lost a family member to suicide by firearm. Um, I think about how ERPOs could have been useful in that situation. I worked on suicide prevention for a very long time. This tool can certainly be used to prevent suicide and can certainly be used by families to save the life of a family member they're concerned about. When we think about an ERPO petition against someone, um, we don't need to think about it as a, an adversarial or combative thing. It's a tool to save lives. Thanks. Thank you. Wow, that's amazing. Okay, well, we 
have some, I've, we've written out some questions, but on your tables, I hope, um, are some index cards if anybody wants to handwrite any questions for the panel. I'm gonna start with a few that we've prepared already, but the point of this is for this to be interactive and for you all to participate. We now have experts here to help us understand this so that we can go out and take action in our community. So I'm just gonna get started with one and we'll see how that goes. Um, I was gonna start, I think, with um, all of you maybe. What are some of the red flags that would raise sufficient concern about suicide? If any of you want to, to raise that, Karen, you can start that. But, mm -hmm. but if you want to kind of talk to us a little bit about that, and as we see these red flags, that's, that would be how we would know to go and, mm -hmm. and get a petition. So how many people have ever attended a training about suicide prevention? Wow. I see a lot more familiarity with suicide than DV. That's interesting. Um, so. There are a number of risk factors for suicide, and I'll try to boil them down because I used to teach 14-hour um, trainings about this, so I won't subject you to that. Um, so we can look at experiences and we can look at behavior. So sudden changes that are not positive can be a trigger for suicidal thinking for a lot of people. Um, things like divorce, job loss, the death of a loved one, um, public rejection. We see this a lot with younger people who are at risk of suicide. Um, one of those sort of my world just tumbled out of orbit situations can be really destabilizing for people. Um, suicide risk is linked to behavioral health concerns like depression and substance use, but not always. And it falls across all kinds of groups of people and identity groups. It looks different in different communities. For example, firearms are used less for people under 18 than for people who are older. But we also can look at how a person's behaving. Um, patterns of reckless behavior, for example, um, reckless driving, sudden increases in substance use, sudden involvement in violence, um, those changes that show a person's not really invested in taking care of their safety can be a warning sign. Um, people expressing feelings of hopelessness, I have a problem, my life is bad, it won't change. Or people expressing feelings of being helpless in the face of something they can't control. Um, we can also watch this at times of transition and making the link here to domestic violence. Um, domestic violence perpetrators are at high risk of suicide, sometimes used as an abuse tactic, sometimes because being arrested or being suddenly held accountable for something is one of those world out of orbit situations. Um, so really the, what I would leave people with is if somebody's behavior seems really out of character or you just get that kind of gut feeling, this person is not themselves, I'm concerned about them, I can't really put my finger on it, that's a good time to ask about suicide risk and asking that question does not increase the person's risk. Right, that's important, thank you. So I guess, Kim, if maybe you could kind of talk to us a little bit about the standard of proof. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, we know that uh, people are going to go to the court and they're going to petition and they're going to have to sign a declaration or an affidavit. And if you could kind of talk about the, the standard of proof that the judge is looking for in order to enforce an order and also maybe some of the statements that, that uh, would rise to that level that, that the, the judge would be looking for in those declarations. Sure, so at the ex parte or the emergency phase, the standard of proof for the court is reasonable cause, which is similar to probable cause. So more likely than not that a crime has occurred. That is the same standard for arresting somebody as well for a crime, to give you indication of that. And at the full hearing, it's by a preponderance of the evidence, which is similar to all our civil protection orders in the state. So our domestic violence cases, sexual assault protection orders, and stalking orders are also by a preponderance of the evidence. So that is 51% or more. And what the court, when they're looking at an ERPO petition, both the emergency and then the full hearing, there are 15 different factors that the court can consider. Many of the same ones that were just raised here today. I would say that some of the biggest things that the court is gonna look at is, is there a threat to self or others? So that's sort of one of the, the number one things when we're looking at an ERPO petition is, is there some type of threat? 
And I would say you don't have to have a behavioral health crisis or what some folks refer to as a mental health crisis. We're trying to change that lingo and say behavioral health crisis. As my colleague, um, Sergeant Poskonski, I'm gonna steal his words, he would say, you know, it's a focus on words, actions, and behaviors. So that's really what we're looking at. Some other factors that the court considers is protection order history. Is this somebody who has a history of arguments with their neighbor, anti-harassment orders, prior protection orders, domestic violence arrests, and arrests or convictions for any DV or felony convictions. Those are different factors the court considers. And one that I didn't think about until more recently, the court also looks at substance abuse. So alcohol and drugs. And that's something that we have seen, and I didn't put that up there, but I believe at least 40 or 50% of our cases of the ERPOs have involved also substance abuse. Great, thank you. Does anybody have any questions on, on any of those issues you want to follow up on? Yeah? Yeah, uh, why don't we start with you? Um, yes, um, I know that we, sh I think, just passed in the state legislature, it was um, a Senator Frog's um, and it was related to youth and ERPOs. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that if you're concerned about, um, you know, a youth um, considering harm against themselves, um, like suicide, and, but they can't own guns technically because they're under 18 years of age and now um, can you remove the firearms from the adult in the home through that law, or what? What exactly has changed? relation to so I testified on that bill and the context that came out of and I'm looking at Renee for guidance back there it was from the mass shooting task force so those are recommendations from a bipartisan work group about really looking at school safety cases I don't know if they I don't recall it it factoring in suicide the cases that we've handled were juveniles that made threats to harm other students or members of the public and we were concerned because we knew they couldn't purchase but we also had specific information that the family members, parents, had access to guns. And we identified, it came up with the mass shooting work group that I was present on that that was a real concern. And we had a couple cases here in King County where we had parents that were very, not giving us reassurances about what they were gonna do with their guns is how I'd say it. And you would hope that parents in that situation would be responsible. And I think the vast majority are, but we had several that we had significant concerns and we wanted to be able to have, have that legal question defined because the statute was silent on ERPOs at, to juveniles. So that was part of Renee's folks and everybody else's work to really, to include that so that we can come in and say, we're not gonna take the parents' guns, but we're gonna say that that minor, that child that's in your home, you can't have the guns in there or that child cannot be in the home. There needs to be something, it's about access. So I don't know if that answers it, but. So basically the child has, either the guns have to leave the home or the child has to leave the home. That's how we're interpreting it because we want, we really want the court to make that determination. We just wanted to say, it's up to a judicial officer to say what you're gonna do. Because before, I think there were some issues of whether courts could even have jurisdiction over parents because here it's the minor, the parents haven't done anything. So it's really to clarify that and just talk about the access. Can I add something really quickly to that? So outside of legal requirements though, it's really a best practice that if somebody in the home is in crisis, that guns should be either removed or secured. And our Lock It Up program partners with firearm retailers that give people a discount on safe storage devices and we have lots of information available about what those are. Um, we can actually provide help for family members of people who've been, who've gotten an ERPA petition um, who don't know how to store their guns safely. There's lots of information out there and we can even get them a reduced price. That's great. Yay. Uh, yes? Oh, I was just wondering, it seems like from the media that I have seen, I'm kind of assuming or thinking that suicide rates, especially for young people, are going up. And um, just specifically the last six months, those headlines have been um, ones that I've read. So I was wondering if that's true, and then how, if it is, if ERPO, you know, is taking that into consideration. So can everybody hear the question well enough? Okay. I think, I think if I can restate it, she, she is, believes that in the last six months or so, so it seems as though that there are more young youth suicides. And she's just wondering if that's really true and whether or not uh, ERPO might be able to 
address that issue. Did you did you want Karen to respond to that, or is anybody? Um, I can respond to the suicide rates part, and Kim, I'll defer to you on the ERPA part. Does that make sense? Sure. Okay. So. It does appear that suicide rates for young people have been rising um, since 2018. Um, there ha has been some media of varying quality covering recent incidents, and public health isn't commenting on those incidents right now because we don't have enough information. But um, about 70% of the time when we reviewed cases, we found that if a young person dies by suicide with a gun, that gun belonged to a family member. So that certainly has implications for herbos for people under 18. And just to answer the herbal part, it's not something you know that, to be honest, we've thought about in the context of minors in suicide until you brought it up. We were really focused more so on the threats of harm to others, but it's a good point. And I don't know, I can't, until we see a case, but I think it, there's possibilities that that's an option as well. It's the same issue about access, as I said before. Okay. Oh, Catherine. Okay. Could, could you lay out exactly what the standards of evidence are, how long we need to track history, or is it a brief history, so people can understand? Like, it's very important to know the standards of evidence to get their case one. So, so Catherine was talking about really having a good, clear picture of what kind of evidence a judge might need in order to um, actually really approve the order. So most of the time, you know, when a petition is coming before the court, it's, we have a couple important process, processes in place for due process, and that's important when we're talking about these laws. So the petitioner, whether it's that family member or the law enforcement agent, agency is documenting all the different categories to kind of support those 15 factors that I talked about that the court looks at. So really when you're coming to petition, there's no other evidence that I've ever seen other than the petition itself that's coming before the court. And we, I should offer, we have an advocate in our unit that can help anywhere in King County with anybody, any family member, and I'm always available to take questions to also walk anybody through that process. I've gone down and we personally walk petitioners and law enforcement through every phase. So, and I'm sorry, I'm losing track of the question. So in the evidence that's needed at the full hearing, mm -hmm. usually we have the, either the petitioner, so the family member would come in, they're sworn in in court under oath, just like any of us that would be testifying would be. Sometimes if, it's, if there's opposition on the other side and they have an attorney, it can be sometimes testimony back and forth. Most often, law enforcement or family member petitioners are swearing in before the court. They're standing by what's written in the affidavit. If they have any additional information, sometimes there may be a social media message that's shared. There may be a letter from a therapist or that type of thing that's presented. So it really varies, and we have judge, different judges almost every week, so the practice, it's really hard to say how uniformly those hearings are held because it's a little bit different each time. But it is not a criminal standard, it's a lower standard, but there is an opportunity for the respondent to present evidence and bring witnesses as well, and then the court is making a credibility call. So at the end, the court needs to determine by a preponderance of the evidence if this individual is a significant danger to themselves or others by having firearms, specifically being able to purchase, possess, or have access. Thank you, thank you. Look, if we could kind of move on then maybe a little bit, Amy, if we could pick up a little bit of the connection with the domestic violence world and ERPOs and perhaps if we could take it from your perspective, both in terms of statewide issues, um, we're really lucky here to have the regional enforcement unit right here in King County, but this is a really big state, you know a lot about how big it is. And then also kind of tie together the, when offenders are put into treatment, um, if protection orders are in place, you know, how, how might that look? Sure, so we do a risk assessment on offenders who come in for treatment, um, and we're looking for risk factors uh, that have to do with are they a threat to themselves or others. Um, we look for things that tie them to society. We talked about some of the, you did a really good job of talking about some of the risk factors for suicidality, and we look at those risk factors. Um, do they, does that person feel like they've lost everything recently? Um, did they lose their job because of a charge of domestic violence? Um, did their family move away from them? 
Um, do they no longer have access to their children? Um, that kind of stuff puts them at extremely high risk. So as we uh, assess their risk factors, we just look and say, is there anything left in their minds that they're holding on to? Um, and if not, uh, that puts us on high alert uh, and we look for that. As I go along around the state and I, I talk to folks in King County, uh, our providers understand and know about the extreme risk protection orders. Uh, when I go to some place like OMAC or the tiny towns outside of Spokane, they don't even know it exists, right? So I'm kind of the messenger on from Olympia that's going to all these little tiny towns across the whole state, anywhere where we have a, a domestic violence treatment provider, and I, I'm doing my best to educate on even the existence of these things. Where we need some help is now if my providers become aware of it, if the family members become aware of it, because our providers talk to victims as well, then how do we get those things enforced in all these tiny towns across the state? Um, so we're not all as lucky as here in King County where this is happening, which is awesome. Um, but we're looking at how do we make that work statewide. Um, so I think that's a big issue. Anything else you want me to answer? I, I kind of lost track. Oh, I think you did great, don't okay. you guys? Yeah. Great. Does anybody have any other questions you want to raise about domestic violence? Yeah, for Amy. Oh, I Okay. Sure. Um, how, what is the general timeline from the time that a petition is filed to when a person can actually be enacted and actually be enacted? Is there like a general timeline? So most of the petitions are, uh, they're immediately issued. So once they're, you fill out the forms, you come to the clerk's office of wherever you're going to file. And I should back up and say that these can be filed initially anywhere, any court in the state. So it could be your district court, your municipal court. But at the full hearing, they're all transferred to, to Superior Court. So in King County, that's here in Seattle or down at the RJC in Kent. And that's just done by statute. Um, I'm sorry, what was the rest of your question? How long between when the petition is filed to when it would actually? So the temporary would be issued immediately if the court issues it. It goes into immediate effect. So it has to be served on the respondent. So if it was a family member petitioning, they would bring the petition to the court, the court would make a determination in what we call ex parte or emergency basis to issue that order. And that's done usually pretty quick. That process is not very long. Um, and we, I can go into more detail after if you need. And then that order is temporary, so it's in place for 14 days. So the hearing, the next hearing has to be set within 14 days in Superior Court. And then sometimes it can be extended if there's difficulty in finding the respondent to serve them, just like our protection orders. And how long do you, b between the court order and when the police actually go out to actually serve the order? Do you? So, I mean, we're encouraging, these are extreme risk situations, so they need to be served immediately. So we've had difficulty with outside of King County where our clerk's office will say that their protocol is they have to mail the order down to them, which is not gonna work, right? We're not gonna wait three or four days to do it. So we've kind of taken that task on of notifying law enforcement, working with our detective or whoever's petitioning to make sure that if it's you know, a victim that lives here, but maybe the respondent lives in a different county for whatever reason, that we're working with law enforcement to make sure that they're served immediately. And then once they're served with that on the temporary phase, it's an immediate surrender. So we're not giving people an opportunity to turn it in 48 hours later when it's coming from law enforcement. It has to be, the surrender has to occur there. And so that gets trickier with law enforcement, how we go about that. But law, that's law, for law enforcement's job, not obviously for the public. Right. Yeah. How, how, has, how is the process for training police officers yeah, so the question is about training. Yeah. So we've done three, we've done two gun summits, one here in King County for law enforcement and other folks. We've done one in Spokane. We have great partners in Spokane who are trying to do this work and spread that. We're doing one, I think, coming up in May in Pierce County. So we're definitely doing that. We're also working on a webinar just to be able to put out information because we can't physically appear everywhere and we realize we can't appear and do the work. So we're trying to train. We're training other prosecutors internally. All the prosecutors in my office, we've had 
some, or we've had opportunities to train other folks just to bring the awareness. So we are working on that with law enforcement and we're also with the Basic Law Enforcement Academy. We've worked training materials, so we've just finished up for all new officers coming through and then I believe an education component for every officer that has to watch it throughout the state. So that's our big focus, it's taken some time, but we're almost there. Okay, Becky? Hi there, I was just gonna say as a domestic violence survivor, I'm very happy to live in the county, this is great. But just kind of to Amy's point, what you were saying about how some of these other towns and parts of the state aren't enforcing or able to enforce these laws. And I think a lot of us who worked hard on um, the ERCO law once it's passed by the ballot and she's like, hey great, done, you know, and, and I can see now like oh my gosh, there's a huge portion of the state that's not enjoying the same protections as we are here. So uh, what would you recommend that we could do to to help that? Because I find it I find that really concerning. So I just want to know like what action can I do as a citizen to help with that? So I've been asked to make sure that we restate the question and I and Becky was really just expressing that the, this was she was very happy about us getting ERPO and and how grateful we are to live in King County where they are implemented and we have actually really powerful prosecutors and police who are actually doing this but again the question is is are there any recommendations from our expert panel on how we might be able to make sure that this is available to everybody in the state because this is a statewide law and everyone deserves this kind of protection. Anybody want to take that on? Well, I'll start, but I don't know that I have the answer. Thank um, you. But if I understand right, it's the city and the county here in the Seattle area that has taken on funding um, to implement this law. And so uh, if that was to be replicated throughout the state, that would take us in this room talking to our cities and counties to ask for funding to implement the law. If that's how you've done it here, um, the other option would be to ask your representatives uh, for the state There's to fund a statewide mm -hmm. um, ability to implement the law. Uh, those are the options I see. I agree. So I, I just want to put you all on notice that actually local and state politics matter. So contact your legislature, go to your city halls, you'll get more take action items later, but that's the way we're gonna do it, is all of us one at a time in our own community. So thank you, thanks for the question, Peggy. I did get a question brought up from uh, the audience. Maryland apparently uh, recently voted for issuing a huge number of, of ERC, ERPOs. They've been apparently doing a really good job. And again, we're back to the money. Uh, the question being, do they have more resources, more funding? for that than we do. I think Renee will take that, because she's the expert, but I, I was sh very surprised by their numbers, so. Yeah, so they don't have more resources necessarily. They are have a practice that the judges right now, every time they do a, D a DVPO, they also do an ERPO. Wow. Which is probably not what should be happening, actually. Mm -hmm. So the numbers are like inflated in a way that, um, yeah, you know, I think it, it, mm -hmm. it sounds like they're, are a lot more because people are accessing a lot more, but really it is if you were to find DVPOs, you know, all of the POs, and assume that our judges would also be doing an ERPO automatically, you're getting a huge, um, a huge increase. The other thing in Maryland that is different than here is that um, people in the medical profession can also uh, petition the court. Cool. And one and thing I would add is in King here. County, we're not duplicating orders. So if, and I want to put this out, this is critically important. If you have a domestic violence victim that needs restraint provisions, the extreme risk protection order is not going to do that, right? So the ERPO is just an order about guns and concealed pistol license. And I should have put that on the slides. But a domestic violence protection order is always going to have greater protection for our victims that are seeking physical restraint provisions because it also ties with an order to surrender weapons. So essentially, that order to surrender weapons is is like an ERPO. It gets into the system to prohibit the firearm purchasing, if that makes sense. Okay, I want to add, um, bring up one of these other questions, and I think this is kind of important. Yeah, the question is, are there times when asking for an ERPO might actually increase the risks? 
I think sometimes we don't think along those lines, but for example, if the gun owner is a police officer or in the military or uh, has a security job and having an order against him to give up his gun is going to also mean give up his career, or there are things that people need to think about before they just automatically run to the court. <laughs> Amy, you want to take a jab at that? Do I ask good questions or what? <laughs> you ask the hard, tough questions. Um, there's no there's no black and white answer to that. Um, I would say it's case by case, uh, but certainly if if there's a, a high risk situation where someone feels like this person's life or others are in danger because this person has weapons, that has to take a back seat. Um, their job and what they might or might not lose. Um, we have to take care of the immediate risk first and then deal with those other issues. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah. absolutely. See anybody else want to Chip in on that? No, I agree with that. I and mean, we have those daily, not daily, but weekly discussions on some folks. And we definitely have folks in the military and law enforcement and yes. other members, um, very sensitive cases that we have those ongoing discussions. And, and sometimes when it's tricky like that, we're doing a multidisciplinary team approach. So we're having other folks also staff cases, Chris and some of my other colleagues who have advocacy skills. So we're bringing in, and law enforcement especially, and including sometimes you know, upper levels of law enforcement as well. So they're, they're not easy dis decisions, I would say. So how are we doing on time? Oh, good, excellent. Any more questions? For, yeah, uh-huh. Are the police officers at risk when they go into service and they're trying to So, yeah, so this question is really important, talking about police officer safety when they are serving extremist protection orders. It's definitely a very dangerous situation. And when we were working on the model policy for that and we had discussions with law enforcement, I mean, that was, you know, the number one, number one concern. And it still is. And we, so we don't, on the service part, you know, from Chris and I, from the prosecutor's standpoint, you know, we're leaving that to the professionals. So law enforcement, they have different triage systems. Sometimes they go with SWAT teams. You know, they're doing different things. I would say that some of the unique things that Sergeant Piskonski's team has been able to do is to be able to get folks maybe out of the home. So you're making contact with them, not inside the home. So there's different things. And I wish she was here to really share that with you. But, but so there's definitely, those are definitely concerns. I'm not gonna say that they're not. They're very dangerous situations. Both the DV offenders, the most dangerous defendant in the criminal justice system. And then certainly our extremist protection order cases have a lot of suicidal ideation, suicide by cop. It, they're high risk. So the, the, the airport comes with a search warrant? So. It doesn't come with a search warrant automatically. So we don't have a state that allows that up front. So we have to give the respondent in our state an opportunity to know about the order. And so they have to be served with it. There's other states that I believe can get them at the same time as petitioning, and our state does not do that. So we have to be even more so careful, law enforcement has to be careful about that process. But we have, we staff the high risk ones, we have search warrant templates often ready to go and and have those discussions with law enforcement should we need, need to go there. And I, and I think we do also have to remember the high risk that law enforcement takes when they are uh, answering any call and they don't even know a gun is there. Uh, so, you know, um, traffic stops are high risk because so many people have guns. And so hopefully, you know, the, the police officer will see that this also is a part of their own officer's safety to get those guns under a controlled situation when they know what they're doing rather than just walking into a, a random family disturbance call and fa facing a gun. So, yeah, good questions. So I, uh, I think maybe what we can do, I, 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 do, should we go on for a little bit, or I think we've got some action items that we need to cover, and I want to be sure that we get to those. Do you guys have any? Yes, Chris? Well, I would just say, just in response to that, I think that's the biggest barrier that we have in implication, is all the things that we do statistically do heighten the risk. Well, feel free to come up here, that because... They do heighten the risk, and so when we, and, and, and Kim and I have been doing this, and Renee have been doing this for a long time, like the biggest question we get from law enforcement when we try to implement is, this is dangerous, and, and it is. But I guess the example that we have here is that we are doing it and it's working and we take great, we, we, we staff cases, we sit down and we, we really think about the risk to the victim, we think about the risk to the officers and we try to come up with positive solutions and we make that extra effort. Um, 
But that's if you, as you're in your communities and you are talking about ERPOs, that's the big question you're gonna get from law enforcement. It's always what we get. So. Okay, great, thank you. So we are so grateful to our experts. Thank you so much for your time and uh, yay.